Good afternoon. I'm Dan Lipkin, head librarian of the Phillips Library at the Peabody Essex Museum. And I'm very pleased to welcome you to our panel, Witch Trials in Salem, then and now. We're very glad that you've chosen to spend some time with us today. And please note that closed captioning of this program is available via the CC button in your Zoom toolbar. Next slide, please. This work of contemporary jewelry was created by the Aquino Wampanoag artist, Jonathan Perry. We're honored to have it on view in our current exhibition, Salem Stories, which is organized around the architecture of the alphabet to present 26 vignettes about the people, places, and events that make Salem, Massachusetts, the city it is today. Jonathan's work is a component of the letter A for Always Indigenous. By starting here, the show begins long before the beginning of Salem and acknowledges that this land, which we now inhabit, was first indigenous and always will be. So I'd like to begin the program by respectfully acknowledging that the Peabody Essex Museum and the Phillips Library are on the ancestral territory of the Agawam, Pawtucket, Penacook, Namkeag, Massachusetts, and Wampanoag. Many other indigenous communities have lived and moved through this place over hundreds of generations and indigenous people from many nations live and work in this region today. Please join us in honoring their communities, their elders past and present, as well as future generations. Thank you. Next slide. The conversation today relates to two current exhibitions of PEM, Salem Stories, as I've just mentioned, in the Salem Witch Trials 1692. The Witch Trials show is the first major exhibition since 1992 of original documents from and objects related to the crisis. I hope you've seen these exhibitions or will have a chance to see them before they close. Many, many thanks are due to my PEM colleagues for pulling this together and helping to make it happen, especially Catherine Robertson, Bethany Beatrice Gravel, and Mark Wood, all currently working behind the scenes to help this go smoothly. Big thanks to our creative services, guest experience, and marketing teams, and special thanks to Annie Harris and the Essex National Heritage Area for arranging online access to their short video, Examine the Evidence About the Witch Trials, exclusively available to all of you via Dropbox until tomorrow. The link to it was included in the primer document that we sent out via email yesterday. A bit of housekeeping. Everyone is currently muted and cameras are off due to today's amazing turnout. So we do encourage questions. Please feel free to send them to our panelists via the chat or the Q&A box, and we'll get to as many as we can in the final portion of the program. In one note about our panelists, I regret to report that Juliet Diaz is unable to join us today due to an unforeseen emergency. We'll miss her contributions to the conversation and we wish her and her family the very best. I'm very pleased to introduce our moderator, Kristen Harris, who will in turn introduce each panelist as they appear. You can find a fuller biography of Kristen and all of our panelists on the pre-read document that we sent to you yesterday. But in brief, Kristen Harris is a public historian from Salem, Massachusetts. She holds a BA in American Studies, specializing in early American history from Penn State University, and an MA in American Studies, specializing in death studies and popular culture from UMass Boston. Kristen has been a public historian, educator, and interpreter at the Witch House and the 1630 Pioneer Village, and has led walking tours in Salem. She's currently a historical interpreter and lead actor at the Boston Tea Party Ships and Museum. She hosts a podcast, Life After Midnight, Strange History, Salem Style, and is a permanent member of the Immersive Game Theater Company, Intramersive LLC. Kristen has the goal of continuing to teach through art and connecting folklore and public memory with public history, theater, and historical interpretation to help people gain a deeper understanding of our past and how it can connect both emotionally and practically to the present. So Kim, thank you for all of your work preparing for this program. In advance, thanks to you and all of our panelists for what will be an engaging conversation. So please take it away. Thank you, Dan. Um, thank you so much for introducing me and hello to everyone else. Um, before we begin, I'd just really like to thank the Peabody Essex Museum for their exquisite work in bringing both Salem stories and the Salem Witch Trials exhibits forward. Uh, I have had the pleasure of being able to see both of those. They are incredible and a wonderful contribution to this community. That being said, um, where do we begin? In talking about the Salem Witch Trials, it is never an easy thing to do. The Salem Witch Trials has many different ideations as far as memory, popular culture, 
it's actual history, different theories, different misconceptions, and it's never an easy topic to cover. So I'm just gonna begin by giving a brief overview of exactly what the witch trials were, which you should have also received in your primer, but talking a little bit deeper about some of the other issues that I think we'll sort of be talking about and confronting today. So in start, Salem 1692, what were the witch trials? Uh, the witch trials were a widespread ep epidemic of accusations of witchcraft beginning in Salem Village and spreading to include accusations over two, in over two dozen communities within the Massachusetts Bay Colony. During this period of upheaval, a court system was put in place to try and if need be, eradicate any suspected witches from the community. Over the course of events, 200 people or over 200 people were accused in these communities. 20 people were executed for the crime of witchcraft. Five people died in jail due to harsh conditions and over 55 people confessed uh, to committing sundry acts of witchcraft with others in the community. It's not that simple, however. Were any of them witches? The short answer is no. All of the people accused of witchcraft during the events of 1692 and 1693 were Puritans. While some of their accusers were Quakers, all were practicing Christians who believed in the Christian God. The definition of a witch in the 17th century is a little trickier. It is a person who had agreed to serve the devil in direct opposition to the church. While there were certainly Christian people practicing folk magic, it's important for us to remember as we go forward that this was not their religion, rather a cultural practice that was widespread and used against them during the fervor of the witch hysteria. However, this practice was normalized in popular culture in culture at the time. What a witch was not in the 17th century is someone using herbs for medicinal practice, which was also normalized uh, and used in medical practice by both midwives and doctors. That being said, I said something that you're sure, I'm sure you're guessing is a little funny, that people were using folk magic in the 17th century, but it's important for us to make the difference. So what was folk magic? Folk magic and counter magic in New England. Puritans believed in something called the invisible world that was all around us at any given moment and that had the ability to impact our daily lives in physical and spectral form. As such, there were several accepted forms of cultural practice to protect oneself from these attacks. Many of these folk practices were benign in nature, some in history were not, but it is important to remember that all these were cultural practices not indicative of any separate life path or religion and were often practiced simultaneously with one's religion. Some of these practices included things like something you may be familiar with, shoes in your walls and your doorways. Uh, this is an image from the Lexington Historical Society of some shoes that were found in the walls of the Hancock Clark Parsonage House. These were sometimes called concealments and were thought to bring good luck or to ward off any unwanted, uninvited, or harmful spirits by catching their feet. They may also have used things like Daisy wheels or hexafoils, sometimes called uh, witches' marks. These are apotropaic, coming from the Greek word for averting evil. And these are magical markings that have been discovered in homes, historic places, castles, barns, and even caves. During the 17th century, they can also be found on personal items, such as marriage chests or other pieces of furniture and smaller items, such as this tape loom owned by Rebecca Putnam, which is on display currently at the Phoebe Essex Museum. You may also find witch bottles, which are an Anglo practice that comes from a very long history. Um, but these are Bellarmine or Bartram jugs usually that you can fill with things to protect yourself. Some of these things could include hair, fingernails of people in the household, iron nails, a pierced leather or felt heart to represent a heart. Uh, and these could be buried in chimneys or fireplaces to protect the home. You could also find Poppets, which I'm sure many of you who have studied the witch trials have also heard of. These are sometimes wrongly referred to as voodoo dolls. Uh, poppets have no specific ties to the practice of voodoo, which is an Afro-Caribbean polytheistic religion and culture, uh, but they have been widely used throughout history, as have effigies and dolls in different ways, not just in folk magical practices, but even in protests, counter-protests, everything like that. So effigies are something that is very widespread in use. So we just have a couple examples, this early New England poppet, which is in the witch house in Salem, Massachusetts. Uh, some from the 1940s from the Museum of Witchcraft and Magic in England. And this other one over here from the Museum of Witchcraft in Boscoe. 
<laughs> difference so being that uh, the simply superstitious then becomes deadly. What was once common becomes a threat uh, as a community is under siege. Over the course of the witch trials, these practices started to be turned against those practicing them as evidence of witchcraft. Spectral attack accusations stated use of pins from poppets and other such things. Oils and cures become sinister. Cunning men and women become criminals. What was once a common cultural practice for a majority of people is now seen as malefic magic and evidence of harm. Some examples of this are Bridget Bishop, who was, had been previously accused of calling her second husband, Thomas Oliver, names on the Sabbath day in 1768, and both her and her husband endured public punishment for this. After Oliver died in 1680 without leaving will, Bridget was accused of witchcraft but released on charges due to insufficient evidence, and in 1687, she marries Edward Bishop, a prominent Sawyer. In, his in this testimony that you see here against Bridget, John Bly and William By ac accused Bridget of having poppets in her cellar that they found while doing work there. Though Bridget was innocent of all of the charges against her, we do know that she was also the person that had the most physical evidence of witchcraft against her. Other examples of folk magic being cited in accusations, Anne Pudiator was accused of witchcraft by Mary Warren during her examination on May 12, 1692. She's a prominent midwife and widow. When arrested, it was reported that 20 different kinds of ointments were found in separate containers and were seen as evidence of witchcraft. But Pudiator explained during her examination that these were actually soap making materials. So just an example of something that is a completely normal practice during this time being turned against people in this moment of hysteria. Samuel Wardwell, a 49-year-old carpenter from Andover, Massachusetts, confessed to witchcraft on September 1st, 1692, saying that he had dabbled in fortune-telling and folk magic, which allowed the devil to take advantage of him. So this is a, yet another example of, again, that folk magic being a, a practice that is normalized, but not witchcraft as we view it in the modern sense. And here Samuel Wardwell is citing the use of that. And then we have Tituba. A woman of indigenous descent, likely from Central or South America or Barbados, uh, but the lack of records for enslaved persons like Tituba make it very difficult to identify. She was enslaved to Samuel Paris and sailed with him from Barbados, assimilated into Puritan culture, and identified in 1692 as a Christian. She confessed to baking a witch cake at the behest of a neighbor, Mary Sibley, to try and identify the person or persons responsible for hurting the children. A witch cake is an English folk practice that involves making a cake out of rye meal with the urine of the afflicted, which was to then be fed to a dog with the purpose of break the breaking of the cake, which would break magic or curses and out the supposed witch. All of this being said, none of the accused were actually witches. So why is all of this so important? It's important because it is a continuing conversation about understanding the depth of the Salem witch trials and the legacy it has in our community today. While none of the accused were witches, they were practicing folk magic. It is also important to differentiate this folk magic from modern witch practice, which has be also become a prominent part of our society today and has as much of a legacy in our history as do the Salem witchcraft trials of 1692. Eventually, Salem wanted to reckon with its past, and it did so in several ways. Historians started to come forward as early as 1837 with the lectures on witchcraft by uh, Charles Upham. He then later publishes a lengthier document. And then we have Winfield Scott Nevins in 1892, comes out with Witchcraft in Salem Village in 1692. From that point, it didn't stop. The interest in the witch trials is something that has never left us and I don't think ever will. It's depicted in popular culture starting in 1890 with the witch spoons that were issued by the Daniel Lowe and company. The building still stands in Salem today. You may know it as Rockefellers today. That also stands on the site of where the original Salem Meeting House was in 1692. Then you have Arthur Miller's The Crucible, which is perhaps the biggest legacy to popular culture that we can see with the Salem witchcraft trials, used as a euphemism for McCarthyism and social injustice. And the witchcraft trials continue to be used for that today, which is incredibly important to the conversation at hand. Once a site of hysteria, Salem has now become a haven and a place for reflection. We do have memorials here to those that were wrongly executed and accused of witchcraft. And we also have modern witches who have made this place a home and are just as much of our community. So I'm sure you're wondering, how do we talk about this? How do we have this conversation 
and bring this community together to talk about this in new and meaningful ways and continue Salem's legacy. And that is why myself and all of our panelists are here today that I'm very excited to introduce. So without further ado, I would uh, like to say, what lessons can we learn? And how do we come together to continue Salem's legacy? And hopefully those are some questions we can answer for you all today. And now I would like to bring in Margot Shea, who is an associate professor at Salem State University uh, and holds a PhD. And Margot, I would like to thank you so much for joining us today. I'm very excited to speak with you and uh, ask you some questions about the importance of the Salem witch trials and their legacy to public history. Um, would you like to introduce yourself a little bit before we begin? <laughs> Um, hey there, Kristen, thank you so much for inviting me and a big hello to everyone who is uh, joining us today. I'm really happy to be here and I'm so happy that this conversation um, is happening in a, in a slightly more formal way than I know that it's been happening for at least the past 20 years in Salem. All right, excellent. So a uh, couple questions for you, obviously. Describe your relationship and research in regard to the Salem witch trials. What interests you about the histories and legacies of Salem in relation to the witch trials and to the history of witchcraft as it has been practiced and perceived? Well, I want to start by saying that I enter into this conversation with a lot of humility. Um, I have a ton of respect for historians who have dedicated, in some cases, their entire careers um, to the study of the Salem witch trials. People like my colleague at Salem State, Tad Baker, have poured over the evidence. They've studied every inch of the landscape. They've put the history of Salem through its paces in every conceivable way. And we all owe them a great debt. Um, my interests are different. Um, they're the obvious things, of course. I think as a history professor here in town, I encounter new students every year who choose to come to Salem to study history because of the witch trials. It, it captivates them and it inspires a passion for history. And if you know anything about sort of trends in higher ed, you know that um, people like you and I who have studied history formally um, are sort of on, a, on a, a trend that's not going upward, right? It's not considered to be practical and kind of easily transactional to um, a job, right? right. So, the, so Salem um, has a really important impact in my life as a professor. Uh, also, our history majors during any October um, that finds us not facing a global pandemic, they're giving tours. They're taking tickets at entrances to museums. They're working at the info booth at the, on the pedestrian mall on Essex Street. They're participating in living theater. They're serving food. They're mixing drinks. They are involved in every aspect of the heritage tourism industry that brings over a million visitors to the city of Salem in a given year. Um, and, you know, finally, I served for several years on the board of Voices Against Injustice. Farah is the president of that board, and she's going to be talking to us in a few minutes. Um, so those are sort of some of my, like, entry points, or they're, they're my gateway uh, into Salem um, and the witch trials. But my interest um, stems from two really broad themes that ground my work as an historian and a public historian. Um, and the first is how communities grapple with unique or singular historical burdens. Mm. How do people carry difficult pasts? How do they negotiate it? How does the past control them? Or how do they take control over the past? And how this changes over time? That's really been sort of one of the fundamental questions that I bring to my work as a scholar. Um, and the other is really about place. Um, it's about, specifically, I'm really fascinated by places that are divided because of their histories mm. and how different people can stand on the same ground and focus on strikingly different elements of that place and its past. 
Um, so I just want to talk for a, a couple minutes about these things in relation to Salem and in relation to um, a city in Northern Ireland called Derry um, or Londonderry. It has two names, so we'll give you a clue um, that I think has some really intriguing things in common with Salem. And Derry is a place I've studied and lived in and written about and recently published a book about. Um, after Salem, Derry hosts the largest Halloween gatherings in the world. Um, it's not as big as Salem, but it's more concentrated. Last year, 150,000 people came to the city in a three-day period. Wow. Um, Derry also, like, yeah, I mean, it's wild. It's a tiny, it's like there's 100,000 people living in the city. So you're doubling oh, wow. the population in like a weekend. <laughs> Crazy. Oh <my> gosh. <laughs> um, it's also kind of like got a twist though, because Derry has a very storied pagan past. Um, and it is a past that has really been uh, obscured and erased in a lot of ways. But it was reputedly a center of Druidism 2000 years ago. It was a place, place people came to to learn magic um, and to learn to serve as intermediaries between the visible world and the invisible world. And I think it's interesting that you were talking about that in relation to the Puritans and the belief in the invisible world. Um, and Druids harnessed energy um, from sources of power that were hidden. And so I think like, you know, a lot of people know that Irish Catholicism specifically kind of incorporated a lot of pagan practices um, into, uh, into faith traditions and faith practices. And then that Irish Catholicism had a relationship with Wicca, with sort of contemporary Wicca practices. So I just, I find it interesting that and of during this period um, of witch trials in Britain, particularly, or England and Scotland and Wales, during the Elizabethan period, um, when Ireland was colonized by England, this process included the marginalization of Catholics and Catholicism. And it's partly because those faith traditions that came out of this past um, that was mysterious, it seemed to Protestants to bring people a little too close for comfort into a kind of intimate and personal relationship with mystery. Mm. And I, I really think it kind of, it helps us get a handle on that historical moment, right? It's like the beginning yeah, yeah. of the scientific revolution and increasingly like things need to be observable and rational and organized and cataloged. And lots of people that didn't fit were literally demonized. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that worked in two ways, right? People that didn't fit in um, for all kinds of reasons were blamed, they were persecuted. In our case in Salem, some were executed for events and phenomena that didn't fit, right? Diseases, spoiled crops, bad weather, you name it. Um, and you just, you see that in Salem get manifested during the trials. Um, and you would like John Hale, you know, who was the minister at yeah, Beverly yeah. said, um, God gives us what we need and no more than that, right? If you don't need it, it was the work of the devil. Um, yeah. And so I, I think that this kind of connection to Salem um, and the, the fact that both places are kind of wounded places, Salem because of the witch trials, and Derry because of the events of Bloody Sunday when 13 unarmed civil rights protesters were shot and killed, mm -hmm. um, it sort of also lives within the ways that we experience the past in the present. That's, that's excellent. And I just, I actually didn't know a whole lot about Derry being a center for pagan practice. So that's really wonderful that you bring that forward and that we can sort of see those parallels, not only with the invisible world and the importance in the social fabric in both places and both cultures, but also that importance of those symbols being used and those places being used. Would you say that Derry sort of has the same legacy that Salem has because of Bloody Sunday with that being used as a sort of impetus to speak on injustices and those marginalized peoples that you were just talking about? Do you see the same in Derry as, as Salem? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it's a little, it's complicated by the, the broader history. Um, but I think that there is a, there is a resolve hmm. to not let the past 
um, control the present and the future. And that lives in people, you know, from school kids to city government. Excellent. And so continuing on this sort of path, because I know that uh, your background is in public history, what do you think is so important about the continued public interest in the Salem witch trials in particular? And can you speak to a little bit more? I know you've already actually kind of answered the question when you were talking about your students, you know, participating in the, in the tourism industry downtown, participating in the history in industry downtown. But can you speak a little more to the sort of the continued importance of that participation as far as public history goes? Yeah, I mean, I think that you know better than anyone that when we talk about public history, I think we're talking about sort of, we're talking about lots of things and we're talking kind of on a macro scale about how people engage with the past. And then we're also talking on a very practical level about um, the economic relationships between heritage and the places that become home to particular stories that ignite the imaginations um, of people. So um, I think like on a broad level, I just, I think it's really important to say that the enduring interest in the witch trials um, has a lot to teach us if we're willing to learn. Um, some of those things have to do with history and how we learn history. Um, and others, I think, have to do with really our radically changing experiences of um, and involvement with spiritual practice and meaning making um, in, a, in a society that has moved away somewhat dramatically from organized religion and faith practice. So I don't know how those things are related to each other, but maybe as we go along, we'll figure that out together. Um, in terms of history, I think you know, you can come to Salem, you can come to Danvers, and you can stand in the place where the accusers and the accused stood. It matters that the physical landscapes of New England have been preserved and that one can stand in this city and feel the earth beneath our feet as a kind of portal to the past, right? It's, yes. it's two times in one place. And you can stand at Gallows Hill. You have that relationship to the past and that's important. It matters, um, I think, that the archival record preserved people's names who were associated with the trials. The past we learn about in school, especially the 17th century past, it's about governors, it's about leaders, like it's about much. dates. <laughs> it's boring, it's not about ordinary people. It is boring, right? <laughs> like, I, I mean, frankly, like it matters that Salem in 1692 was a dumpster fire. Like, to it use does. The <laughs> academic word, right? Like, and it was a dumpster fire because of the, the government officials too. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Which is poignant. <laughs> totally. Absolutely. I mean, I just think people, we can relate to tragedy. We can relate to atrocity. We can relate to mean girls. We can relate to a government sort of affecting our day to day. Yeah, we totally can. Um, and so I think all of those things are really important to keep in mind about the fascination. Um, and at the same time, I think people come to Salem partly because it has become a welcoming space for anyone who is curious about things that cannot be explained through reason and ration. Um, rationality. You know, three quarters of a million people identified as Wiccan or Pagan in 2008. And in 2018, a Pew Research study suggested that there were 1.5 million people in the United States who identified as Wiccan or Pagan. Um, and Salem, you know, became a city dedicated to openness and tolerance and welcome um, to a place that will be home to diverse communities of people. And I think that the folks that come to visit Salem um, are important to be respected um, and seen and made visible because of that, as well as because of the history of the witch trials themselves. That's such an excellent 
summation. I don't even think I have to ask you the third question because you've already answered it. No, it's such a wonderful summation of everything we're trying to do in this conversation, right? Say that the two can come together and in fact need to come together to continue that legacy, to continue that welcoming and to continue that conversation in a way that's productive and meaningful between those communities that, that they exist apart, but they also exist together. And I think in Salem, as you said, that is the most beautiful part about both the history and the modern community is that we exist together. One part of it doesn't exist without the other. So thank you so much for that. That's an excellent, excellent summation. Um, so thank you, Margo. And I think uh, with that, uh, we're gonna bring that back later too. But I think with that, we're gonna move on uh, to our next panelist, especially since Margo did a wonderful job um, in the summation of the sort of modern witch, Wiccan and pagan community here. I would like to bring in Erica Feldman from House Witch. She is the owner, creator, proprietor, all around amazing business person and behind house switch. Uh, so thank you, Erica, for joining us. Um, do you want to give a little bit of an intro about yourself before we just launch into the questions? I'd like for people to know a little more and more about you before we go on. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Hi. Um, psyched to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, so I, um, I have a BA in history and I have a master's degree in gender and cultural studies from Simmons college and my, focus um, in graduate school was witches, um, sort of as a lens to look at a number of different things, both, you know, um, through history and pop culture and literature. Um, and, you know, what I was really interested in was just sort of um, the opportunity to reclaim the figure of the witch um, as a ra radical feminist icon, sort of, you know, um, if you kind of think about it in one way, the witch is like everything that our like cis hetero white supremacist toxic masculinity patriarchy capitalism um, isn't in a way um, for a lot of the reasons that Margot uh, very eloquently talked about witchcraft and witches is such a wily subject um, for a lot of the reasons we've already talked about right because yeah. there are people who were sort of actual like healers and herbalists and midwives and then there were like so many people who you know like you talked about in the intro were practicing christians who were just like accused of witchcraft so it's a wily subject and um so i chose a wily way to look at it um and i ended up living in salem i'm, I'm originally from chicago and to be honest, it was really rent prices that got me uh, to Salem because I more so studied the European witch trials. And I actually didn't really know that much about the Salem witch trials, but I knew I was moving to Boston and uh, rent prices scared me. So I started looking <laughs> in the suburbs and I was like, oh, well, it would make sense that I would move to Salem, obviously, to study witches. Uh, and as you know, Salem is a little bit less expensive than Boston. So that's how I ended up here in the first place. And I just fell in love with it. Um, and so I stayed, uh, after I finished grad school and eventually opened my shop in 2015, which is called House Witch. And, um, it is a radical intersectional feminist witch store, um, that is also about making your home feel really nice. Um, I know those are a weird, I, I'm a Gemini for those of you who don't know much about <laughs> that basically means I have like two different personalities and sometimes they kind of match up and sometimes they don't. But um, so that is me and where I am right now, I guess. Excellent. Um, yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, and I mean, on that note, when you're talking about a radical feminist intersectional witch shop that feels good for your home too, I, my first, first question to you is going to be, tell us a little bit about uh, your practice and how that sort of feeds into your goal of bringing, you know, that radical feminism and intersectionality into your practice. Talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, that's actually a great question. Um, I mean, obviously, but, uh, <laughs> you know, so my personal practice is, is very private. I'm definitely a spiritual person, but I think that the overarching goal sort of of House Witch is really to put the agency for people's spirituality like back in their hands, um, right? I think, you know, sort of the dominant religious structure here in the United States of like Judeo-Christian religions is very hierarchical, it's very top down. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it's really, really important 
when we talk about, you know, kind of modern witchcraft, or at least the type of witchcraft that, you know, we sort of practice at, um, at House Witch, and, and, and we sort of like to um, empower people to, to, to take the reins themselves and figure out what is meaningful to them and what um, they want to celebrate and what they want to worship. Um, and that that is just as valid because I think, you know, again, as we were talking about sort of during the time of the witch trials, you know, the rise of the scientific revolution, the enlightenment, all of these things is really where you do see this colonization of like people's minds and people's spiritualities. And, um, you know, so we like to sort of teach people um, to unlearn <laughs> um, a lot of that. And so, you know, aside from any sort of, you know, we definitely, um, we revere the earth. Um, you know, so much magic comes out of the earth between plants and rocks and, you know, people and animals. Um, you know, I think that's something that's pretty consistent across uh, most of my you know, staff and community and customers. Um, but other than that, you know, it's really like, it's really up to everybody to, to figure out their own kind of thing. And I just like to provide people some tools for doing that work themselves. Yeah. And, you know, I think that's, that's a really important point is that, you know, even, even I think in the modern witch community, as a, as a solitary practitioner myself, there is that sort of colonization of ideas that you still see among even the modern Wiccan pagan community. So uh, I, I definitely appreciate you pointing to the fact that you encourage others to find their own practice and that it is very personal and it's very, it is a very personal solitary thing for a lot of people. And I think that's, that's wonderful. Um, and you said something really interesting that Margot also just said. So I'd like to sort of focus in on that a little bit because it is in one of my questions where you said that you talk about honoring the earth. And I know Margot had said she enjoys in her history sort of practice talking about space and the identity of a space. So with your modern practice, honoring the earth and being in Salem, I know you already said sort of why Salem with the rent prices, because me too, That's trust me. <laughs> but as far as honor there are other practical Midwesterners out there. That's, that's one but part, as, yeah. But as far as honoring the earth and sort of thinking about how that has a different connotation for a modern witch practitioner in Salem, right? This is a place that definitely I feel draws a lot of power and definitely draws a lot of emotion behind it. So why for your practice, Salem, has that sort of cemented itself in you since you've moved here? Or was that always something that you sort of were leading toward because of the identity of Salem? Well, I think there's definitely something here, you know, I mean, I think that, you know, again, like owning a shop here, I mean, people make pilgrimages here. You know, I mean, they, they, they fully make pilgrimages here. Some people come every year, you know, some people save up their whole lives to be able to come here. And so, you know, there's something here. Um, in grad school, I, I looked into this idea a little bit laid out by Michelle Foucault and like, I definitely, mm. oh my God, do not. We can't go there. <laughs> I'm definitely, I'm definitely going to like bastardize this. <laughs> this <laughs> he has this idea of, um, a heterotopia, which is like a place that exists only so that something doesn't exist anywhere else. So like the easy example that my professor gave me was um, like a graveyard, right, is a place that dead bodies are so that they're not everywhere else. And so I love the idea of Salem as a heterotopia of of witches and celebrating witches. Um, you know, for those of you who don't know, like our high school mascot is a witch. There's witches on our police cars, there's witches on our newspapers, there's witches, you know, and where else do you see that? You know, I mean, I, I know there are places, I was in Pendle last year in England, but it's really not the same at all. Um, and so it's this place where, you know, A, I think, you know, and Margo said a little bit about this too, we've really reclaimed it as a place of being, open um, for diversity and for, you know, sort of, I don't want to say outsiders, but, you know, we like it here. We like it weird here in Salem, right? You know, <laughs> and, and, and I think that that's what a lot of people are drawn to. I think that's definitely like part of what I was drawn to here. And I think you can feel that kind of in the air and in the earth and, and, and that there's just this, you know, inherently magical 
image everywhere. I mean, it's which city, right? So it's just like, you can't really talk about Salem without talking about magic. And I think that's really important. It is really important. And um, we do have a lot of questions coming in, but I think I'm gonna hold off on some of those till the end. Um, Oh, here we go. Here's a question I think that's pretty relevant to you, Erica, if you don't mind. Uh, someone asked, what are your thoughts um, on the resurgence of folk magic and witchcraft today uh, and sort of the importance in this current moment? Uh, Margo, I know, was talking about the marriage of sort of the, the actual histori histori excuse me, historicizing the people involved in the witchcraft trials, but also looking at that sort of resurgence and what that means to Salem and how we can marry the two. So what are your thoughts on this sort of resurgence of interest in folk mag magic, modern witchcraft, um, and how we can sort of marry that with the particular history of Salem. Yeah, I mean, I love it. We're working on a, a booklet right now for the store. Hopefully we'll be out at the end of the month called What We Learned from the Witch Trials. Oh, excellent. Um, that's sort of gonna be aimed, you know, uh, directly at, you know, my audience, which, you know, is a more modern practitioner probably. Um, and, I'm sorry, what was the, just, just, <laughs> it's October and I own a store in Salem, so I apologize everyone, I'm, I'm all over the place, but. Um, no, just um, your thoughts on the resurgence in folk oh. magic and witchcraft today and how that sort of is, is poignant while being a, a practicing witch in Salem in particular. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, obviously, I love it. I mean, I truly love it. And I'm and I know we're going to talk about sort of the commodification of it all a little bit later, you know, which is something I really like talking about. Um, so I love it. I mean, obviously, like, you know, it's my career at this point, but I, I love anything again where people are unlearning and rewilding um that was a phrase that um, a friend of mine and i kind of bounced around with for a while because i think that anything that is sort of that calls into question what a lot of us have been taught what a lot of a lot of what is sort of de facto i mean i know we have a separation of church and state but it's kind of hard to see that a lot right and so we have all these like uh, hegemonic structures of, of religion and government and all of these things. And to me, you know, witchcraft and folk magic is in direct resistance to those things, right? Um, and, you know, here in the United States, you know, again, in, in Europe, there was a huge witch craze where, you know, historians really have never been able to narrow down even like a ballpark figure of the amount of people persecuted. Um, and that is where witches were burned. Obviously there were no witches burned in Salem. Um, the ones that were executed were hung or uh, crushed. Um, and so there isn't really this tradition where there was actual sort of, uh, you know, folk magic being practiced all over the place as there was in Europe. And so I love to see the, I love to see the resurgence. I love to see people kind of stepping outside of, you know, what is typically thought of as, you know, um, okay to, to practice. And um, I think any kind of resistance right now, uh, you know, especially the last few years, anything that's, that's kind of in resistance to the, um, to the, dominant culture is. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, you actually brought it up before I could even get to it. Um, as someone who does own a business grounded in modern witchcraft practice, um, what are your thoughts on commodifying it as an aesthetic and sort of like a lot of the big businesses starting to come in and commodify that as an aesthetic? Yeah. So, you know, there's two different sides to this, which is why as a Gemini, I like talking about it. Um, you know, Obviously, like, I don't love seeing Sephora, like, selling witchcraft that they, you know, probably sourced unethically and, you know, people along the way probably, like, weren't paid living wages and, you know, all of the sorts of things that come along with mass-produced goods, you know, put out by corporations. Like, of course, I, I you know, cringe. Um, something that we really try to do at Housewitch is source pretty much everything from individual people who make things with their hands and source them ethically um, and are able to sort of pay themselves a living wage. I think that's so important to a witchcraft practice. Again, in reverence to the earth and in reverence to all 
of the beings on the planet. I think if you're using tools or using knowledge gained from some of these less, less kind of ethical places, you know, what does that say about your practice? But on the other hand, as a girl who grew up in a working class suburb of Chicago, Illinois, that did not have witch stores, that didn't have new age shops, that didn't have botanicas, all this kind of stuff. I mean, where did I find out about witchcraft? You know, Barnes and Noble, right? <laughs> oh my gosh, true. <laughs> I mean, and, and I know so many people like that, right? You know, um, and so it's like, if we're not, if, if we don't have that kind of scope with things, then like, you know, there's, we're just cutting out a huge part of the population. And, you know, for me, and I'm, I'm grateful that this happened and, and this is just for me, I'm not saying this about any other person that practices um, any kind of witchcraft. Um, but for me, like with Wicca, I ran into the same sort of issue, you know, like I was definitely a teenage Wiccan um like so many and but ultimately you know i couldn't get my hands on the things that you were supposed to have for spells you know there were particular herbs and particular types of candles and like you know again that just wasn't available to me and so you know that piece of that religion and again like i do not i do not mean to offend anyone like however you practice is is amazing but just for me as a 14 year old with no access to stuff like that um uh, that was sort of my hard stop on that and that's what made me start looking into more of like what's at the heart of this like what can we, you know, what can you just do yourself to, to kind of alchemize um, in the ways that, you know, witches do um, without sort of all of these other tools, which is like hilarious now that I own a witch store <laughs> that sells magical tools. But um, so it's both, right? I mean, we, I mean, I think that like having both is something that we just kind of need to embrace in like many, many areas of our lives that like you can just have both things. And so I think it's both, you know, I think it's a bummer when it's problematic and it's things that are, you know, made unethically and source poorly and whatever. But on the other hand, it's like, if it's reaching someone that really needs to be reached, um, you know, someone who really needs that connection to spirit and the only way that they're going to get it is through that kit at Sephora, then, you know, I mean, who am I to say that they, they shouldn't have that? That's really poignant. And actually, um, that you brought up the accessibility of those things, I think is really important. I think a lot of, a lot of people don't really think about that when they think of the resurgence of modern witchcraft and they, they don't really think for some reason we think about accessibility in a whole lot of other ways, but when it comes to modern witch practice, we don't really think of accessibility sometimes. And, it, and it's sort of missed. Well, um, I think now that we have the internet, right. It's like, I, I'm, I'm obviously dating myself. There was like definitely no internet when I was, um, right. there, there was, but like, I wasn't, you know, you, you weren't ordering like herbs on it. Right. Uh, yeah. 1997 or whatever it was. But, um, <laughs> but it's so important to talk about that. Um, I think it's very important to talk about that. I think I want to add one more thing, which is just to say that this idea of like authority, right? And like who has the authority to say what is authentic witchcraft versus what isn't. Sort of for me, and like no pun, like no pun intended, but flies in the face of what witchcraft is all about. Because for me, witchcraft is about dismantling authority and it is about, you know, questioning how these structures were built, who built them, and so who gets to say what's what, who has the authority to say what's a religion versus what's science, and, um, you know, what what is rational versus not. Um, I think it's part of a witch's job to question those things, at least for themselves on a personal level. And so again, I think anybody taking up this mantle of authority of like what is commoditized and, and therefore like not as good as, like I, I just, I don't subscribe to that. Good, good. Yeah, and thank you for that. No, um, that was excellent. And honestly, that's a great segue um, because you said it's a going against that dominant culture and sort of questioning who gets to make the rules and who gets to decide for everyone else. Um, so thank you so much, Erica, and we'll see you in a bit. And I'd let, now on that note, like to bring in uh, Farrah Wolfson, uh, who is from Voices Against Injustice. And I think she should be coming on. <laughs> um, the host needs to turn my video back on, so I'm here. 
All right. I could not start it. Awesome. All set. All right. Great. Hello, Farah. <laughs> Thank you. I'm enjoying this conversation so much. I'm just ready to talk. So thank you. Excellent. Well, um, Farah is the co-chair for Voices Against Injustice here in Salem. So um, would you like to introduce yourself a little bit before we launch into the questions? Just sort of talk about what you do with Voices Against Injustice. Sure. I, I will start because Erica identified herself as a Gemini. I'm a Libra. And I'll talk about that in a second because as I'm listening to the history of the witch trials, it does relate to something I'll say. Um, I'm a teacher. I'm not a historian. So I always look at the why and how we can make things accessible. And I came to Voices Against Injustice um, as someone who's been an activist involved in different social justice movements. I studied African-American studies and women's studies in college, particularly interested in the civil rights movement and the Holocaust. And later came to be interested in the Japanese American incarceration and other aspects of World War II. Um, where there's so much overlap in themes with the things that we'll talk about today, but I'm delighted to be here. And I mentioned that piece before I get into voices about being a Libra, because I really, I did not know much about the Salem witch trials. Um, I grew up in Florida and my education was from the crucible. So I thought the book and the movie. So I really thought of Daniel Day Lewis and Winona Ryder. I was not thinking. <laughs> Oh, um, and I'm sorry for the people. I know there are people with very deep ties to this history. Um, as a teacher, I have been learning every year. I've been learning in my work through Voices. I've been learning when I visit the memorial, which is just profoundly beautiful. And that Libra piece is about coming in without really thinking about what it meant and what it meant to the people who were the victims, to the people who lived here and then moving away from what I thought was too lighthearted for my taste and then coming to find that balance between owning that history and defining it in different ways. And so it's an ongoing process and I'm just so grateful to live in this community where there is that dialogue and so many opportunities to learn and at Voices, that is some of the work we do. And we're grateful to work with our partners at Salem State and our partners at PEM. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, I am co-chair of Voices Against Injustice and our organization started in 1992. It was the 300th anniversary of the Salem Witch Trials. And at that time, we were called the Salem Award Foundation for Human Rights and Social Justice. And there might be many people here who remember that. But in 2018, we changed our name. And that was because Salem Award was really only part of what we did. We changed it to Voices Against Injustice to be more reflective of our mission and our work. If you do know anything about us, um, we, it won't come as a surprise when I just say three words. We really think of our mission as remember, honor, act, and that's our mantra, it's our mission. It really is something we come back to all the time. Obviously, we remember the people and the lessons of the Salem Witch Trials, and that's really what today is about. We also honor individuals and organizations who are working to confront social injustice with courage. And I just wanna take a moment to invite anybody who is interested, um, our award, the nomination window is open right now until November 1st. And we really would love to have um, some nominations from a diverse crowd um, to add to our list. It's a really accomplished list of individuals. And um, I will post that in the chat in a little while, how you can find that nomination form. Um, so we invite you to find out more about us and also to nominate somebody. And what we do really is we are stewards of the memorial. We create um, programs and events. And right now we're looking at ways to strengthen our advocacy efforts. We're in a different place than we were in 1992. So as an organization, we're constantly changing to both honor the history that defines us and also the history we're living so that 
will be comfortable with how our current history defines us and the legacy we leave. And um, also in terms of that advocacy, we've had really meaningful conversations on our board about how can we champion, herald these champions of social justice and shy away from using our voice or our voices in the way we can. Um, so I, I just want to add one piece about the remember um, and just want to invite anybody who hasn't been to the memorial in a while prior to an event we had with PEM in September, an online event. I visited the memorial a couple of times and it gets back to what Margo was saying about place and what Kristen uh, reiterated. Um, it was very impactful and it takes your breath away even if you've been there multiple times. I had never visited on September 19th or on September 22nd before this year and it was unforgettable. It's something I hope to do again next year. Um, and I also had the opportunity to hear different people talking, surprised, like, this all happened? They all died in 1692. And just the things that you hear and the dialogue you can have with people who stumble upon the memorial weren't intending to go there and really want to learn the history. So. Yeah, I mean, I would say the same, that every time I go there, it never it never loses its impact. Um, and I have been lucky enough to be there um, on anniversaries a few times when I was working for the Witch House. Um, and I do remember when it was called Salem Award because uh, I know that they they donate a portion of their tickets uh, to that to, to help that organization, which is wonderful. Um, so thank you, shout out to Elizabeth uh, for continuing to do that and continuing to be involved in that. Um, my goodness, I don't, I don't even know where to begin because that was just so important, what you said about it being a place and having that impact and... Yeah, can I add something to that? Yes. <laughs> so I, I also just, as somebody who does have an interest in um, the Holocaust, both as a Jewish woman and as someone who um, sometimes looks to the darkest moments in history and some of the people who have um, been upstanders, some of the people who have been heroic just in their own courage. The fact that Elie Wiesel was there to, for the dedication and the quote, you know, I'm struck by his speech that if you are not familiar with it, it's really worth looking up. But he has another quote that I'm going to misquote terribly here, so I apologize. But um, he talks about having a breathing space when you talk about Auschwitz or Treblinka. And I think that gets back to the balance I was referring to before in terms of the witch trials and the seriousness of what happened. Um, so I, I just want to acknowledge just how amazing it is in the midst of some kitschy museums and really cool stuff. And really, Witch House is an amazing shop and we have some great stores in Salem. But then you have this really meaningful spot that is uh, one of the sites of conscience. Um, we have that designation. Um, if you also are interested in the other sites of consciousness around Massachusetts or around the world, um, the memorial is one of them. That's excellent. Um, well, you already sort of answered my question about giving a background about Voices Against Injustice, so thank you. Um, how do you see the events and the language surrounding the Salem witch trials having a direct correlation? Because I know you said you're always updating at Voices Against Injustice. You're always making sure that you're you're moving forward. You're bringing in new things. You, you know, you, and sort of progressing with the time. How do you see the events and the language surrounding the Salem witch trials having a direct correlation to society today? And do you see a direct correlation to issues like, say? police brutality, which I know has been at the forefront of a lot of conversation um, for quite some time. So uh, how do you see that sort of being important to those conversations? Well, um, so the language, I think the most direct impact, you know, and as someone who lives in Salem, just the, term, the use of the term witch hunt, which is so um, overused and misused currently. I mean, we know that there are really witch hunts that are happening in our world today. And it's a huge disservice when we just toss that term around. 
um, words matter. And, um, and also just it negates the fact that it, in terms of who has power, and I know there are linguists and historians who can speak much better about that, but I think we need to be very careful with the use of that word because that is on the serious side of what happened here. Um, and when we look at who's most vulnerable and who's being persecuted, um, and not to ignore the five who died in jail. Thank you um, to the person who put that in the chat and I will bring that back to our board in terms of how we can um, add to the telling of some stories because we are about representing the different voices and making sure all voices are heard. But thinking about the punishment and you know incarceration and death, um, I you know, I would say what immediately comes to mind is, you know, historically, well, if we're talking about modern times, definitely thinking of the BIPOC community, talking about police brutality, but also um, how uh, just people in our communities are really hurting right now. Um, I would include the um, uh, just black transgender women of color being murdered. I mean, this is, this, the tie is painful because we, here we are and people are dying and we are not, it just, it keeps happening. And so I think that goes to your question about police brutality as well. You know, what will be the tipping point? When will we actually learn? We can look back at 1692 and criticize or not criticize, but critique what people did or didn't do. But in our own time, what are we doing? Um, are we standing up enough? Are we using our voices? Are we putting an end to things? You know, the moratorium on housing evictions in Massachusetts, that ends on Saturday in the middle of COVID. You know, how are we treating people who are vulnerable? And I would say, um, we cannot have this conversation without talking about immigrants and um, many different groups of immigrants in, uh, in our country. You know, and a lot of people talk about the border, but we have people whose lives are being destroyed because they don't have the power and whether um, they have TPS status and have been um, battling a different battle than people who are undocumented, we really have to look at what are we doing, what are the practices, and, and who are we hurting. Um, isn't family separation a form of torture when we talk about these young children being separated from their families for an administrative violation, something beyond their control? And I think people might say, well, that's not torture. We are also sending some people back to death in their own country, to torture or death in their own country. And so I, I'd like to think we're better than that and that we're learning from it and we can use our voices. I think the lessons in terms of the, the correlations, you can go to any of those groups and you can't have that conversation without talking about Native American family separation, which the Upstander Project mm -hmm. did so well with the film Dawn Watch, which I think Penn had a screening a few years ago that we co-sponsored as voices and it's like we just keep cycling through the same trauma we apply it to different groups let's use this history to do better by people that's that's so excellent thank you and and so i'll kind of s sort of skip the last question since you already sort of answered uh you know how we can learn from those lessons and i kind of want to continue that right because you did say we can do better yeah. we're trying to do better we, we are in many ways doing better, but we still have a long way to go. And I think that it is so important for people in Salem in particular to sort of think about what are we doing? Especially, I think, if you call to, if you call to memory the legacy of 1692 continually, how would you say as being an activist and being someone involved with Voices Against Injustice, for people to sort of look inward if they are taking a call to that memory and that history and, applying that to their own daily lives and applying that to their own practices to say, obviously we wanna learn from this. Obviously we don't wanna keep repeating this. 
what would you say as an activist is the best way to, for people to sort of internalize that and apply that to their daily lives? I mean, I just see it on so many spheres of our lives, you know, and you look at, um, I talked a little bit about who, but we look at scapegoating, we can look at whose voices do we elevate. So even with our own circles and within our workplace, that's not, it's just how we engage with other people. And there are countless opportunities to be involved with groups. Um, so I don't want to misrepresent what we do at Voices. So Voices is not doing direct action. That's not who we are. We're about honoring the history. We're about elevating these different groups. And sometimes that happens through our award. Um, this year, we gave our award to the Massachusetts Bail Fund, and it caused us to think about these are heavy, heavy issues to contemplate and think about what does it actually mean that we have a cash bail system in this country. And we have groups like Massachusetts Bail Fund, we have Bijan, B-I-J-A-N, um, working to help people um, who are immigrants, who are being um, persecuted in our country, how can we elevate the work that they do and encourage people to get involved. In our own community, we have Welcome Immigrant Network. We also have a lot of good ELL programs that are looking for volunteers. And the, the relationships we establish will make the difference. And I think it only takes wanting to be involved, going to city council meetings to speak up or, you know, finding out what's going on in the schools and what you can do, because I, I would imagine the majority of people are coming into a webinar like this with a lot of expertise, a lot that they can offer. How can we take what we study abstractly and apply it to people's lives now? And I say that as someone who studied the civil rights movement, certainly when I was in college in the late 80s, early 90s, there was a lot more I could do to get directly involved but I was up here mm -hmm. and we're in a time that we can, there, you know, there's a rally in when yesterday, there are going to be rallies coming up and not everyone wants to do that, but are you writing letters? Are you using your voice to just call your city councilor and talk one-on-one? -on -one? We have a, are you talking to the mayor? We have so many things we can do and engaging in dialogue to just challenge you know, like I said, my own thinking about what the witch trials are and what it really means, you develop that by listening and learning. And, you know, so even listening tonight and hearing what Margot has said and what Erica has said, I will look at witch house differently when I walk in there and think of it in a different way and think of Salem in a different way. And so I think just being open to what surrounds us and not hesitating to use what we can because I think at the end of the day when we talk about this, um, I actually want to quote uh, Director Brian Kennedy from what he said last week, but when we talk about this, are we going to look back at this time and how are we going to explain what we did or didn't do? Um, and so in our talk recently, I'm just going to misquote everybody today, but he did talk about our legacy and how we respond in any given moment. That really becomes our legacy um, if we recognize the heroism and humanity and how we respond. And we've mentioned a number of issues. We've mentioned people who are living in very dangerous times because of their identity. I have friends on the North Shore who feel like they are, their lives are in imminent danger. That's not my reality, but I need to hear that is my neighbor's reality. And so the more we hear that, you know, what do we do with that? Do we just sit with it or do we step up and do something about it? And I am grateful to know in this community, we have a lot of people who are doing something about it. Thank you. Thank you for that so much. Um, and on that note of, of talking about community and being open to each other and listening to other perspectives and other people. We do have so many amazing people in this community. I can't even count on my fingers and toes off the top of my head how many people we do have working towards things like that in our community here in Salem consistently. Um, 
But on that note also, I'd like to bring everyone back in. Um, so bring all of our panelists back in because I think the sense of community is sort of why we're here. The pan name of this panel is Witch Trials Then and Now. And that sense of community and that sense of engagement with each other and with Salem as a whole is sort of why we're all here. Um, so I'd like to bring everyone back in and just, and just, and I'd like to bring Dan back into, there he is. Um, and just thank you all again so much. Um, we have so many questions um, <laughs> that from our, from our panel, our audience. And so I want to thank all of you out there for engaging in this and for, and for asking all of these questions and we're doing our best to sort of keep track of that. We had a really good one that just came through actually that Margo, you said was a great question. Um, how do all of you think that the witch trials would have went if there were adv advocacy groups back then? Um, I think, I don't, I don't know how to really answer that question, but maybe somebody else wants to, wants to take a crack at that. <laughs> I'll just jump in really quick to say that there were all, many advocates for folks who were accused as witches. We, there are records of dozens of petitions submitted by dozens of people on, on behalf of those accused of witchcraft and they basically did no good. So were there organized groups? Uh, I don't, I'm not enough of an expert to say, but there were certainly people in the community who were willing to stand up for those people who had been falsely accused. Excellent. I just add one thing to that also it's that it's so hard to compare in terms of you know I can't even compare to 40 years ago 20 years ago in terms of social media so that's why we you know we are living in a time like none before us and so we have an opportunity that even when people raise their voices it, it, it's just a whole different reality that we live in Thank you. Um, I actually have a question. Oh, oh sorry. No, go. <laughs> I just wanted to um, jump in on to add to what Dan said. Um, and it also reminds me of something Erica said about the ways in which power has traditionally operated. So lots of people were advocating during the witch trials, but they weren't necessarily considered reliable narrators or reliable witnesses. And I just, I think that's a really important thing that we keep in mind when we try to engage the, the actual history, the ways in which um, the world that people lived in in 1692 in Salem really was different. But it's also really important to remember that even while the trials were on, people realized like it was a it was a mess. People knew like this thing was going down in a way that people were going to be talking about it 300 years later. Like they knew that. They did. Um, and I think it's just a really important thing to remember. I think that's important too. And I think one of the things that I always like to point to is that, you know, Reverend John Hale, you know, was so incensed by what had happened that he wrote an entire book about it right after the witchcraft trials. And so for anyone who was looking at those resources, we do have a, a digitized link to that if you do ever want to look at what he's saying. Um, but people were starting to, after the witch trials, even during and directly after, really question their belief system that led to what happened and they were questioning their own dogma they were right away questioning things like spectral evidence questioning the court's usage of that so i think yeah margo it is really important for us to sort of remember that everyone saw what was happening but it was like that slow moving train where i don't i don't know necessarily if anyone could have done more than them essentially stepping in and stopping the trials after those september 22nd executions yeah, I think it is really important that when the circle of the accused started to encompass people who were directly connected to those who wielded power in the community and within Massachusetts Bay Colony, all of a sudden things changed and they changed super quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think, you know, there were some comments in the chat about what we were talking about. And I think that what Farah and Voices Against Injustice are talking about um, today is very, very, very relevant to the history of Salem in 1692. And actually, that's, uh, that's uh, 
Farah, do you want to go? <laughs> yeah, I just want to add, because I had taken notes beforehand. I'm going to actually quote Margo from when, actually, Margo, it might be from when you were on the board, but just that whole idea about the witch trials and what they teach us. And I'm just going to take an excerpt. The whole quote is on our website. But that they remind us, the witch trials remind us that the mechanics of hate can take on a life of their own particularly in communities already grappling with economic and political and social divisions, building community across difference and dedicating ourselves to economic, political and social equality engages the lessons of Salem. It's a very powerful quote in its entirety and the link is very clear um, that we honor the history of 1692 when we stand up with and defend anyone on the margins, as well as those whose voices have been silenced. That's, wow, that's, that's an excellent quote. Thank you for reading that. And it actually goes to a question that I was just about to ask uh, from the audience. Um, so maybe, I don't know if, if, I think all of our panelists could take this question. Um, so for someone to discuss the parallels in today's environment of misinformation, such as conspiracy theories, denials of such, um, as with science, witchcraft, uh, misconceptions and accusations, both in 1692 and in the modern day. Um, so how does that sort of environment of misinformation play into that? And what are some of the parallels that you think are important to draw from that? Okay, so I mean, something that we haven't, I don't think totally focused a lot of attention on is the class divide of the um, witch trials. Uh, and again, I'm not an expert in the Salem witch trials, but my understanding is that, you know, a number of the accused were um, sort of in the lower socioeconomic portion of Salem residents and um, the accusers were uh, in the upper echelons of, of Salem society. and. You know, I think that um, there's a lot of parallels in that um, to today. You know, uh, there are some people who sort of describe the Salem witch trials as a land grab on behalf of the, um, you know, wealthier merchant class of Salem. And I think what we see now, again, is really another society so stratified by haves and have nots. And, you know, I think that, um, and, and you see the, the have nots really, you know, I think the knee-jerk reaction to the advocacy group question is like, oh, well, it's different today, you know? And I think what we all sort of agree on is that it isn't. Um, and that there's a lot of things happening right now that we're all really horrified about and we're all really loud about and we're all throwing a lot of money at different organizations and it's not changing anything. Um, so I think there's some parallels, um, you know, just in that. And I, I think that, you know, the class issue is one that, um, flies under the radar sometimes, but is actually a really, really important piece of the puzzle both then and now. Um, I just, I think Erica, that was so uh, well said, and I want to add to it because um, I, th I think that it's it's not just class, it's also a real paradigm shift, right? In, Historians have lots of different theories about why Salem erupted, but one theory, of course, is that there were two communities um, and they were kind of living according to different value systems, right? There's Salem Town and there's Salem Village. There's a community that's tied to agricultural patterns and um, family relations and tradition. And we might kind of, you know, if we're going to like super oversimplify, we're going to call them um, conservatives, right? In a, in a kind of um, very basic sense of that term. While well, you have another community that's emerging, it's outward focused, it's embracing kind of capitalism and the market economy. It sort of prides itself with a little bit of vanity, frankly, on being progressive. Um, and I, I think that you, when, when we talk about fake news and conspiracy theories and spectral evidence and you know girls taking fits and people pointing accusations so maybe they can get out of doing their chores right i think that we can kind of relate to the ways in which folks refuse to hear each other and kind of willfully don't hear each other and we see lots of evidence of that uh, in the archival you know sort of 
traces from the witch trial period. Mm. Thank you. Um, my goodness, I'm trying to get through everyone's questions. Um, I just want to address a couple of things because there were a couple of history questions here. Um, someone asking about ergot theory and someone asking about um, the effect of children possibly having epilepsy. There's a lot of um, sort of, I think, and this kind of goes to what you just said a little bit and what I think Farah has said and what everyone has said is, um, you know, while things are the same, they are also different. So I think that we have a lot of modern misconceptions that are sort of put on what happened with Salem. As Margot said, um, it goes so much deeper than that. Um, I know that the ergot theory has been disproven by many historians. I just want to address that because it's a question a lot of people always have. Um, and as far as, you know, mental illness, there are some people that have posited PTSD because not only was Salem dealing with the economic strife and the differences in Salem Town and Salem Village, but they were also dealing with a lot of PTSD from um, conflicts with Native American groups in the area. And a lot of the people that were escaping a lot of those attacks were coming down to Salem. So someone that does an excellent job of that is um, in, the Devil's, in the Devil's Snare uh, is a wonderful book. Um, I definitely recommend that if you're looking into that. I just wanted to quick address those history questions because there's something that always gets asked. Um, and I always like to address those. I don't know if Dan wants to add anything to that one quickly. <laughs> Well, I think just that it, this is such a complex event and there are so many factors that went into this, you know, I mean, Tad Baker's book, which I highly recommend, The Storm of Witchcraft, I mean, makes the point that that's, this is exactly what it was. It was a perfect storm of all these different factors with the conflicts, the immigrants and the refugees, the, the you know, town city split. Um, there had been an, an epidemic of smallpox in Boston in 1690 and there, so there had been, um, you know, extreme war and extreme weather, sorry. So all of these things, I mean, in some ways you can find 1692 and replace 2020, right? We have all of that stuff now and it's it's really interesting to kind of, you know, think about how, how the parallels are so strong. Excellent. Um, I wanna actually pose a question to Erica. Uh, so somebody was asking, um, the difference, and I, I don't know if you want to speak on this or if you can speak on this, but people were asking the difference between Wiccan, Pagan, Modern Witch, um, and how that sort of plays into the community today. Sure, yeah, I'm uh, not an expert necessarily, but you know, uh, Wicca is a specific religion, just like Christianity, Judaism, Islam, um, it was largely sort of put together, uh, actually, by a man named Gerald Gardner in the 20th century. So a lot of people think that it has sort of um, really tangible roots to some sort of, you know, cult of earth magic tradition uh, in Europe. And, you know, that's not true. Um, that's okay. Uh, you know, um, and so that's, so Wicca is sort of specifically that. Um, and then, you know, I, I don't know what a definition of paganism would be other than, you know, sort of just someone who doesn't really subscribe to like a monotheistic um, view of spirituality. Um, and then, you know, a modern witch, I think is really um, anybody who wants to call themselves a witch and, um, you know, again, I don't even necessarily feel like witchcraft has to be tied to spirituality or religion for a long time. I identified as a political witch. I still identify as a political witch, absolutely. Um, and so, you know, again, I think it just goes back to sort of what I was talking about before, which is sort of anybody who wants to call themselves a witch can, um, and that, you know, you don't have to be Wiccan to be a witch, and you don't have to be a witch to be Wiccan. I think that there are practicing Wiccans who don't actually use the term witch. Um, so does that answer it? I think so. Okay. <laughs> I think so. Um, and I guess uh, this can go to anyone as well, just because we are sort of getting close to the end and I want to try and address as many of those things in reference to all of the community today. Um, someone said that they were interested in the generational effects of such events, both some of the modern things that Farah was talking about and um, the people in 1692 uh, on the surviving victims, the perpetrators, their descendants. I know another question I saw was, 
Um, did anyone apologize or did anyone come forward? And what I'm always drawn to is Ann Putnam Jr. coming and testifying to the church afterward um, and sort of admitting that she knows not whether any were witches, but that she was overtaken um, by Satan, that she was under a delusion um, and that she deeply and humbly apologized. I'm misquoting her a little bit here, but that she deeply and humbly um, lays in the dust at their feet and begs for forgiveness for her part in that. Um, there was also Samuel Sewell who uh, apologized in his journal. There were many, many people, um, like I had referenced before with John Hale that came forward and sort of talked about their questioning and when that turning point was for them individually. Um, and it did have a lot of generational effects on many, many people involved, uh, both accusers, victims, victims' families, um, et cetera. So if anybody wants to sort of jump in and talk about, um, Dan, I don't know, I'm sure you've probably talked with several descendants. I'm sure you at Voices of Injustice both have talked with descendants and sort of just talk about the generational effects on the community and on individuals. Well, I guess I'll, again, I'm not an expert in generational effects of this crisis. Um, but I do think, you know, something that has gone on to the, the, into the chat here, Cindy asked about how we grew back together, this community, how did it grow back together after the events? And Margot answered by not talking about this for a very long time. And I think the, the silence surrounding that is, is one effect of, of the crisis. You know, people were ashamed of what happened here. I think it takes a long time to deal with events of this, this magnitude and of this seriousness. And I think we're you know, I mean, as a society, as, an, as a country, as America, we are just starting to take the most tiny baby steps towards um, addressing our hundreds of years of, of injustice to the indigenous people, to the black community. And, you know, these things just, this, these things take a very, very long time and there's no easy way. You can't just go from, um, from avoiding it to complete and utter reconciliation. And you know, we have a lot of work to do as a, as a society and as a country. Excellent. I just wanna say one thing. Um, I don't have anything to add other than, because you had mentioned Voices Against Injustice, but in terms of our founding, in terms of many people who have been vital to the growth of our organization, we're indebted to them um, for what they've contributed and how they keep us on the path. So anybody on this call who is not familiar with our work, who would like to make sure that we keep true to that history, please do reach out to us because we are always looking for that balance between being relevant today and honoring the past. And I'm a Libra too, in full disclosure, Farah. So I'm, I'm all in on the balance. <laughs> oh, Happy my. birthday to the Libras. It's Libra, Libra season. Hi. So um, we have about a minute left. So in closing, I kind of just want to hear from all of our panelists. I want to thank um, Dan and all of the team at the PEM for putting this together and for bringing all of us together to have this conversation. And I just like to allow all of our panelists sort of a brief closing thought on we've started with this conversation. <laughs> where do we go from here and it's continuing to sort of honor that legacy and and continuing the work so i'd like to just sort of hear from everyone their, their sort of closing thoughts on the conversation i'll go um i just want to say that um you know something that also didn't totally come up today but that i think is really important in this conversation is the idea of community um and you know something that at least in the European witch trial, something that was really um, problematic for people was this idea of community and it really became weaponized against people and against groups of women in particular. Um, what you found after that, you know, those centuries where uh, witches were being persecuted was that, you know, women wouldn't gather in groups anymore. Um, and that has actually, you know, stayed true in, in some ways up into the present. And so what I wanna say is that, you know, the community piece of my store, we um, have community events there, or we used to, now we have them online, obviously, which is awesome, because we get tons of people from all over the world now. Um, but community is really, really important, and it's really, really important in these times. And I'm, I'm thinking of, um, 
you know, all of the sort of social justice movements that are happening right now, but even just with COVID, you know, um, right when COVID started, I really got this strong sort of um, sense that it was going to be communities that were going to pull each other through this. And we really tightened our community around the store in terms of, you know, who we were ordering from, who we, we, who we wanted to make sure was getting paid and who, uh, you know, we wanted to make sure was being taken care of. And I think that's something, um, again, I think that's something specific that witch trials in general um, really worked against the idea of community. And so I think a great way to um, reclaim the idea of community is to keep that in mind and keep, keep in mind how important it is um, within the realm of social justice and just within the realm of um, taking care of one another. And I am totally not trying to plug, but I did see a question from a baby witch in the chat. And so I just want to say that we, in that spirit, we have an awesome community page that I'm really, really proud of on our website um, that has lots of information about Salem and about witchcraft and DIY witchcraft and videos and stuff like that. So if you're watching this and you wanted to know more about um, specific witchy stuff, the community page, housewitchstore.com slash community, um, because it's really important, so. Thank you. Um, Farah, do you wanna go next? <laughs> sure. Um, I think I was going to also think of community in the sense of bringing people together to have difficult conversations and to engage in dialogue. Um, and when we spoke before about the lessons and um, the reference was made to fake news, also just that that critical thinking piece, how can we look at things um, and recognizing our own power to shift a conversation and we can, whether we are knowledgeable about something or we are the question asker and the seeker of information to engage someone else, I think of the witch trials on a regular basis when I watch the dynamics between people. Who do we publicly give shout outs to? Who do we acknowledge privately? How do we reinforce the power structures, large scale and small scale? And I think that there's a lot we can do within Salem or within whatever community to help change that. Um, when do we schedule events? Who do we acknowledge as being present in a shared space when we start a meeting? Um, how do we use pronouns? And if we're not yet at the place where that feels natural to us, are we doing our research? Everything's at our fingertips and we can be expansive in our thinking. So I, I think just that idea from individual to a community, there's so much that we can do and that I'd like to see us do in 2020, moving into 2021. Thank you so much, Farah. And then Margo, would you like to, to have some remarks too? Quickly, yeah, thank you. Thanks everybody. This has been a really great conversation. Um, as someone who thinks about history and memory, I've always been struck by what I think is kind of an artificial divide between the history purists in Salem and the people who embrace October and all the things that it brings to the city. Um, and I, I just, um, I think about the historian Taya Miles and the work that she's done on um, fascination with ghost tours and the paranormal. Um, and she sort of posits that um, people are fascinated with hauntings and ghosts. And I think that it's a way to kind of pull all of these pieces together, um, including the idea that Salem exists, so these questions don't have to be asked elsewhere. And all of the things that Farah has been saying, um, I think that difference and how we negotiate difference and power and how we negotiate power in American society has haunted us from our birth, right? From 1619 and before. And so I, I think that our obsession with the witch trials and our kind of relationship with that history um, is the reason we're having these other conversations, but these other conversations are the reasons that we're still obsessed with the witch trials. And so I, I really want people to leave with that um, 
that these are not separate conversations, that they are married and they're in very intimate ways. Thanks. Thank you, Margot. Yeah, and um, I would say that would be my closing remark too, is that this has proven today, like just this small conversation today and all of you asking all these questions has proven that that continued fascination and all of these topics very much live together and they will continue to live together and they have to live together. Um, and that they can live together in a, in a community space, um, that they are all relevant to our community here in Salem. They are all, uh, they all have a place here and we can continue to make that happen for people. So. I would like to uh, take, leave it to Dan and uh, thank you all so much for coming. Well, I certainly can't compete with the eloquence that we've just heard from each of you. So I'll just say that um, it's been a real honor to be part of this with you. And I'm really glad that we're continuing and in, in, in beginning the conversation and looking at history and the contemporary. And I think, um, as I said earlier, we have a lot of work to do, but, um, but I think we've got some great people here to do it with. So. I'm, I'm so thankful for your time and for your, your, um, your gifts that you've brought to us today. And, um, you know, this was really moving for me and, and really wonderful to be a part of. So thank you very much. I, uh, I want to mention that this session has been recorded and there will be a link sent to everybody who attended. It will be up on, um, our, I think our YouTube channel and our Facebook page and, um, I really appreciate it and let's, you know, uh, let's keep the memory of those people that were taken by, by past injustice um, to help guide us in the future. And um, I'm looking forward to moving forward with you all and doing the work together. So thank you very much for coming everybody and um, have a great evening. <laughs>